Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're going to be talking about six nutrient deficiencies that can lead to hypothyroidism or low thyroid function. The reason we care about this, or the reason you should care about this, is because these nutrient deficiencies are potentially reversible. They can be corrected. The good thing about nutrient deficiencies is that we're pretty good at replacing them. So if you find that you have any of these potential nutrient deficiencies that I'm going to be listing in just a second, that may be an opportunity for you to potentially reverse or to fix your thyroid problem. Now, there is a little bit of a catch-22, which I will explain here right now, and that is you need to understand this, this concept, and that is nutrients can cause hypothyroidism, but also hypothyroidism can cause nutrient deficiencies. Okay, so we kind of have, you kind of have to figure out, is your thyroid problem caused by the nutrient deficiency or did your thyroid problem cause your nutrient deficiency? And if it is the case that your thyroid caused your nutrient deficiency, replacing it will help you feel better, but it won't cure or fix the problem. Okay, so you need to be aware of this connection. Um, so regardless of your thyroid status, if you're newly diagnosed or if you've had thyroid problems in the past, this information is still going to be important and relevant for you. Just realize that, let's say if you find you have iodine deficiency, well, actually that's a bad example, but let's say you have zinc deficiency and you replace that zinc deficiency, it doesn't guarantee you're gonna fix your thyroid problem. It will still probably help you feel better, but it won't reverse or fix your thyroid problem necessarily or automatically, I should say. So how do you know if you have low thyroid function or hypothyroidism, which again, these are two words to describe the same condition. It just means you don't have enough thyroid hormone in the body. And when you don't have enough thyroid hormone, you tend to experience symptoms like dry skin, weight gain, hair loss, swelling, edema, constipation, poor digestion, low body temperature, and even other hormone problems. So if you have any of these symptoms, there's a pretty good chance that you have a thyroid problem. And that means these nutrients that we're gonna be talking about become very important to you. So let's talk about these six nutrients. Um, we'll go through them. I'll talk about uh, how to know, you know, how to get these nutrients replaced if you think you have it, testing if it's important and relevant, and we'll be talking about all these things as we kind of go. So number one, uh, I want to talk about zinc. So zinc is important for thyroid function because it's required for thyroid conversion. Thyroid conversion is a fancy way to describe the activation of thyroid hormone in your body from an inactive form to an active form. And what that means is your body is taking T4 and it's turning it into T3. I won't get real deep into that concept right now, just understand that zinc is required for that to occur. In addition, zinc is also important for proper immune health. And if, this is really important for your thyroid because the most common cause of low thyroid function is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So if you have nutrient deficiencies which impact your immune system, they may predispose you to developing or put you at more risk for developing an autoimmune disease. And since the autoimmune disease of the thyroid is the most common cause, it's pretty important to have a functioning immune system if you're worried about your thyroid. All right, so what do we know about zinc? Well, we know that in some studies, especially in the elderly, that zinc deficiency is quite common. We also know that people, especially these elderly, this elderly population, when they have zinc deficiency, if you replace that zinc deficiency with zinc supplements, that actually fixes their thyroid. We don't have the same studies for the younger population of pe people, but if we understand thyroid physiology and how I just mentioned zinc is impacting the thyroid, it should be similar in terms of its impact on the younger population as well if you replace a, a zinc deficiency. Now, we also know that thyroid patients are at increased risk of developing zinc deficiency, and that number is pretty high. I would say around 30%, depending on which study you look at. So if you have low thyroid function and you're listening to this, zinc is something you need to be particularly concerned about for that reason. Um, if you want to get zinc in a natural way, aside from supplementation, you can get it from foods. And if you wanted to consume more foods high in zinc, you would want to look at consuming legumes, seeds, nuts, dairy, eggs, whole grains, and you, if that doesn't work or you prefer to use a zinc supplement, which sometimes it makes more sense, um, and I'll be talking about that when it comes to iron and iodine and selenium, then you can also use a zinc supplement as well. All right, so number two is iron. So iron is required by the thyroid because it's required for a protein or an enzyme called thyroid peroxidase to function. And thyroid peroxidase is necessary for your body to create or to form thyroid hormone. So if you have low iron, what that means is your body is going to be less efficient at producing or creating thyroid hormone. Obviously, if you don't produce enough thyroid hormone, you're not going to feel well because you're not going to have enough thyroid hormone in your body and you will be hypothyroid. The important thing about iron though is that it's not something that you should just take unless you know for sure you have a deficiency. And you can check for a deficiency by ordering tests. When I talk about some of these nutrients, some tests are better than others, right? Sometimes we have good tests that can check for nutrient deficiencies and other times they're not so good. In the case of iron, it actually is pretty good because what you wanna do is you wanna look at ferritin, which is a measure of your iron store. Then you wanna order something called serum iron. You wanna get something called TIBC and you wanna get a percent saturation. 
Luckily, doctors are pretty good at diagnosing low iron levels, although they might not be good at just randomly checking you for it. So if you feel that you have it, or if you've had a thyroid condition, or you've been diagnosed with a thyroid condition, you may need to ask for it, but definitely do because it's a potentially reversible cause. And at the very least, it may actually help you feel better if you replace your iron. So women are at a higher risk for developing um, iron deficiency because they lose blood every single month or more frequently or less frequently, depending on how often you're menstruating because of that menstrual cycle. So anything that causes you to lose blood will impact your iron level. And therefore it's important for you to keep an eye on it. In addition to women who are at increased risk, we also have thyroid patients who are at increased risk. And that is because of how the thyroid impacts the absorption of iron in the intestinal tract. The lower your thyroid is, the more likely you are to not absorb iron, which means you're more likely to have iron deficiency. So it's iron deficiency that can cause a thyroid problem. And then once you have the thyroid problem, it can propagate further iron deficiency, which can again make your thyroid worse and start the cycle over again. So iron is very important for you to uh, take a look at if you have been diagnosed with thyroid function. If you want to get iron, um, look for it in certain foods, including organ meats, shellfish, legumes, red meat, and even spinach. Now, again, just a reminder, you do not want to supplement with iron unless you are for sure that you have low iron levels. Um, and the only way to know that is if you check your lab. So it, it's gonna be okay for you to, you, let's say, take something like zinc or even iodine, uh, a supplement without checking your zinc levels or your iodine levels. That's gonna be okay you know, 99% of the time. That's not true of iron. You do not want to take iron unless you absolutely know for sure that you don't have enough of it. And if you wanna look at optimal levels on how to know if your iron is just right um, and ferritin levels, I have blog posts on that. I have other videos on that as well. So I'd recommend that you check out those videos before you start supplementing with iron. Number three is iodine. So iodine, obviously, right? Iodine is required to create thyroid hormone, similar in fact to iron, but in a different way. It actually forms, I like to call it the arms of the thyroid hormone. Um, so depending on what type of thyroid hormone it is, that will, um, kind of informs how many iodines are on that particular thyroid hormone. So if it's T4, it has four iodine arms and, it, and you know two arms, two legs, however you want to describe it. And if it's T3, it has three of these three of these um, iodines instead of four, like T4 does. So obviously, if you don't have these, you can't create thyroid hormone. So that that one's pretty straightforward. What maybe isn't straightforward is the fact that iodine deficiency seems to be increasing in the developed world. So that includes the United States and other developed nations and countries as well. And the reason for that is because people. Um, in the past, they used to get a lot of their iodine from iodized salt. But we have a couple of things happening right now um, in terms of in, in the modern sort of health wave. We have a lot of people who are reducing their salt intake because they are afraid of high blood pressure. And on the same side, we have a lot of other people who are using, let's say, healthier versions of salt, including Himalayan pink salt um, and Celtic sea salt or other types of salt which have more minerals in them. So the addition of the minerals is really good, but it usually comes at the cost of less iodine. Um, and then in addition to all these things, we also have a lot of thyroid patients who are avoiding iodine. So we have the avoidance of iodine actively by thyroid patients. We have the uh, reduction in salt intake and we have the reduction in iodized salt intake. So we have three big reasons why uh, iodine deficiency is actually increasing in developed nations. Now again, iodine deficiency is probably the most common cause of reversible hypothyroidism, uh, meaning if you have iodine deficiency and you replace those levels, you get your iodine back to normal, your thyroid will jumpstart, it'll kick back on and you'll be able to produce thyroid hormone. Having said that, you don't want to take iodine unless you also have repleted levels of selenium and zinc, which we'll talk about selenium in just a minute here. So don't go crazy and um, picking up quite a bit of iodine because if you're using massive doses, uh, then you might run into trouble. In fact, I just had, uh, I was helping a, another friend of mine who is, who is a physician and he was giving a story about somebody who was using 100, micro, 100 milligrams of iodine. Um, and this person ended up having worse thyroid function, probably as a result of that iodine intake, although we won't know for sure. And that's because that 100 milligram dose is, I, I don't know, hundreds of times higher than the, the daily recommended dose, which is usually somewhere around 150 to 250 micrograms per day. Now, if you want to get your iodine, which you have to get, by the way, iodine is not something that your body can produce, which means you must consume it either from food or from supplements. So you must be getting this. Um, you can get it from foods and look for foods such as seaweed, organ meats, cod, salt, shrimp, uh, salt, by the way, if it's iodized, not all forms of salt have it, shrimp, tuna, eggs, and even yogurt. So you can get it from your diet. However, it may actually be better to use supplements to get your iodine. And that's because supplements can provide a more consistent and um, you know, you have a better understanding of how much you're taking every single day. So that's why I say it's consistent. So if you eat, let's say a can of tuna fish, um, you know, and you get a different brand of tuna fish or you, your tuna comes from a different area of the ocean, the iodine content in each of these is going to differ. But if you get a supplement that says it has 100 micrograms of iodine, and then you buy another supplement that has 100 micrograms of iodine, you're getting the same iodine, okay? So it actually might be better for you. Um, and I would recommend it in many people to use the supplement 
the dietary supplement forms of iodine as opposed to trying to get it a lot from your, uh, from your diet for that very reason. Not always required, but something to think about. Some people do get it just fine from, their, from the foods that they eat and they have no problem. So if that's you, then more power to you. Number four is selenium. Selenium is important for the thyroid because it's required for thyroid conversion, much like zinc. Remember, zinc was required for thyroid conversion, but it's also required for glutathione produ production, and glutathione is an antioxidant which protects your thyroid gland from inflammation. So remember when at the very beginning I said you don't want to use iodine if you don't have enough selenium, and this is why. If you consume iodine and you force your body to create more thyroid hormone, you might actually damage your thyroid in the process through the creation of free radicals. Now, normally that's not a problem if you have selenium there. So if you have selenium there, it produces glutathione and it sort of neutralizes that antioxidant um, or, and, or that oxidant, and it's okay. It's not, it's not a problem. You're not damaging your thyroid gland. However, you can push it too hard and you can produce more free radicals than you have oxidants to take care of, and that's when you can run into problems. So selenium, much like zinc, um, is, is very important still for thyroid function, and we know that if you don't have enough selenium, you will have reversible thyroid problems, which again is really important. It's reversible. So if you replace your selenium, then that thyroid, uh, your thyroid function will, will return to whatever normal is for you, okay? That's very important to understand. Number two is that Selenium content in food kind of varies uh, drastically because plants don't necessarily require selenium like they do other nutrients. They don't, they don't necessarily store it, but they do take it up from whatever's around them. And what that means is they're not regulating how much selenium is inside um, of the plant itself. They're just taking it up from their surroundings, which means that the selenium content of food in one state could be different than in another state, which could be different in another country and so on. So if you're trying to get your selenium from 100% from your food, it can either lead you to getting too much, which is actually fairly common, and also too little, which is very common. So it's kind of hard to get that Goldilocks sort of level of selenium, which is why I think selenium, along with iodine, it probably makes more sense to use supplements to get your daily amount of selenium. So one of the most common ways to try and get selenium from foods is to consume more Brazil nuts. Now, Brazil nuts can be good, but they have a huge variability in terms of their selenium content. So one nut, one nut might have 30 micrograms and another nut might have 120 micrograms. So you might consume three nuts one day and not get, not get enough selenium and then consume three nuts the next day and get three times the amount that you actually need every single day. So that's kind of the same thing that happens with iodine, which is why selenium supplements might actually be the smarter way to get selenium because you can get a more consistent level and you know how much is coming into your body. Um, if you do want to use selenium supplements, then, then the range to use is about 100 to 200 micrograms per day. Some people will advocate in the range of 200 to 400 micrograms per day. Um, I think the smaller doses are better just to account for uh, excess that you might be getting from your diet. Okay, So you don't want to push yourself too high because um, selenium toxicity is a real thing. Um, it can actually cause and mimic some thyroid problems. So do be aware of that. Number five is tyrosine. So tyrosine is a non-essential amino acid, but it is required for the thyroid to create thyroid hormone. And, it's, and it does this for two reasons. Number one, it is required for something called tyrosine residues, and it's also required to create something called thyroglobulin. Now, these are both part of the thyroid creation process, so I won't get into the details of what they're doing. Just understand, if you don't have enough tyrosine, you won't be able to create thyroid hormone. So it's similar to iodine, but it's working via a different mechanism. Now, fortunately, uh, tyrosine deficiency is not very common. So it's probably unlikely that you have tyrosine deficiency, although I can't necessarily say that with uh, certainty because, and here's why. So even though when you look at the studies and it shows that most people have a sufficient amount of tyrosine, I still see benefit in people, especially thyroid patients, who, who supplement with L-tyrosine, which is the synthetic version of tyrosine. So it seems to be for some reason, either due to depletion or due to heavy use of the body, some people just need more tyrosine than others. Now, again, I don't know, know exactly why that is the case. I'm just telling you from personal experience that a lot of people benefit from taking extra tyrosine. So I don't know how many people are out there with tyrosine deficiency who have low thyroid function who would benefit from using tyrosine. But I'm telling you right now that if you don't have enough tyrosine, you can't produce thyroid hormone. And if you fit in that situation, it may be wise to try a tyrosine supplement um, because there's just not a lot of studies out there to prove one way or the other, like there are for some of these other things. Like we know for sure that a lot of people have zinc deficiency, which is reversible. Iodine deficiency, reversible. Selenium deficiency, reversible. Iodine, or I already said iodine, but um, what was the other one? Oh, iron deficiency as well, reversible. Tyrosine, we don't have the same data for it because I don't think people are looking that hard for it, but I'm giving you my personal experiences to say that it still might be important, so it's something you should consider at least. And then the last one, number six, is vitamin A. So vitamin A is different from the other ones we've talked about, and it is required for thyroid cellular function as well as immune health. And what we know is, is pretty interesting. So when we look at studies across the entire world, we see that even small amounts of vitamin A deficiency causes reversible hypothyroidism. 
And we, we have a lot of data actually on vitamin A deficiency because a lot of developing countries have huge numbers of vitamin A deficiency. And we see what's happening in these people. Um, you know, obviously it's really sad, but we can look at them at, at, and we can draw information or draw conclusions from the information we see there. And that is that those people have hypothyroid symptoms. When they're given vitamin A, those symptoms of the of low thyroid function, they completely are eliminated. And vitamin A, because it's a fat soluble vitamin, um, it's not as, we don't see deficiency in the United States or developed countries quite as often, but I do think there's a good case to be, to be made that a lot of people, especially people like you listening to this, are not getting optimal amounts. So it's unlikely that you're going to have a gross set of low thyroid symptoms or complete hypothyroidism from vitamin A deficiency, but what you might experience would be suboptimal vitamin A levels, which may you know, impact thyroid function to some degree, maybe five, 10, 15, 20%. But if you stack that on top of zinc deficiency and a minor iodine deficiency, um, you know, suboptimal iron levels, now all of a sudden we have created this situation in which you have a sufficient amount of nutrient deficiencies that are impacting your thyroid in a measurable way. So I think that's really how you should think about these nutrient deficiencies, especially vitamin A. Um, if you do want to get vitamin A, you can find it in foods such as butter, eggs, whole milk, cream, seafood, um, and including supplements as retinol. So uh, vitamin A is one of those things you don't want to go crazy on either because it is a fat soluble. So generally speaking, the way to think about toxicity with supplements is that if something is water soluble, there's very little risk that you can overdose or take too much of it. But if something is fat soluble, which would be vitamins A, D, uh, E, and K, those can, you can potentially overdose on if you take too much. So vitamin A is something you don't want to take too much of, but as long as you're not taking you know, excessive amounts, you don't really have to worry about it. So vitamin A is one of those that you can try and get more from your food. Uh, if you use some supplements like mine, I have vitamin A uh, built into some of them, but again, just the right amount, not too much, not too little, so you don't have to worry about overdosing or anything like that. So the bottom line is that these six nutrients are required for your thyroid to function. And if you have a low level of any of them, it may sufficiently impact your thyroid to the point that you feel it, that you experience low thyroid symptoms. Again, the good news here is that you don't necessarily need thyroid medication to treat the problem. What you need to do is replace that deficiency, which could then naturally improve your thyroid function. But remember, thyroid function, low thyroid function itself can cause some of these deficiencies also. So it's probably not the case in every single one of you that if you notice you have these deficiencies and you replace them, it might not cure your thyroid problem, but it probably will help you feel better. So if you have any questions about these ones, why I picked them or anything else, just leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer those. If you haven't already, make sure that you download my free thyroid PDF resources. I have tons of information all designed to help thyroid patients like you feel better. So if you thought this was helpful, I think you'll really love those resources. Um, and that's all I have for you guys today. So otherwise I'll see you in the next one.